everybody to another edition of Flip History. This is Mr. Belcher. Our topic today is industrialization and big business. Our essential question today is how did industrialization impact the growth of the United States? And our learning outcomes for today, you should be able to understand how steel influenced building and identify if big business owners were robber barons or captains of industry. And if you don't know what those terms are, you will very shortly here. And you should be able to decide for yourself which one that you would classify them as. Henry Bessemer is the father of the modern steel creation through his Bessemer process. And 1850, Bessemer comes up with this process to Im remove impurities from steel, which is basically the carbon, by injecting air through it. And by 1880, we have about 90% of the steel industry creating their steel this way. And steel is greater than iron, bottom line. Steel is much stronger, it's lighter, it's cheaper to make, and it's much more durable. Iron is very dense and brittle and it rusts much quicker. The number one customer for steel is railroads. They need them for the railroad tracks. This is really going to expand the ability of railroad companies to uh, lay their tracks much more quicker and cheaper. Big business itself. The companies that we're talking about here in the late 1800s, textiles, iron, steel, and petroleum are the major industries that are going to grow exponentially at this point. And within these major companies, they're going to create what is known as a trust, which is a combination of companies that are dominating an industry. Uh, trusts are usually there to reduce competition, and this is really going to, to reign true when we're talking about Standard Oil and John D. Rockefeller. The Brooklyn Bridge is going to be one of the creations out of this steel age. You can see there the center of the bridge itself is kind of being held up by the steel cables. There's just absolutely no way that you can build this bridge with iron. It would just be too heavy. Uh, with steel, you can now have this connection. The Brooklyn Bridge itself does take 13 years to create, and when it is finished, it is the longest suspension bridge in the world. Uh, it is the steel it's cables itself that are able to hold it up and like I said iron would have been way too heavy and why the Brooklyn Bridge itself is significant is now going to people allow people to work outside of the city uh, they don't have to live in the same place where they work so they can take the ride into Manhattan every day to work and then go back across the bridge in the afternoons back home to Brooklyn you can see here's another picture again take note of the center part which is kind of being, you can see the little bow in the uh, in the road there itself. Steel creation is also going to allow for this building to be developed. It's known as the flat iron building for its shape. It's shaped like a triangle, very similar to a flat iron in the late 1800s. Without the creation of steel, we just wouldn't have this ability. Uh, we would still have to build outwards rather than upwards. And no, uh, New York City is not the first city to have skyscrapers. The first skyscraper was uh, built in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, this, however, building is in what is now a historical district. It is a historical building. And without the invention of steel, without the invention of electricity and the elevator, this type of building just is not going to be uh, possible to create. We also have the meeting of this time of the Transcontinental Railroad in Promontory Point, Utah in 1869. So this is going to finally fulfill this transcontinental uh, railroad. We're not going to have east and west completely linked by railroads. Our first major in industrialist is Cornelius Vanderbilt. He is going to make his uh, money primarily with shipping and railroads. After Cornelius' death, his son William Vanderbilt is going to expand the company to close to $200 million in, in really 1880s money. So the Vanderbilt itself, again, like I said, uh, Cornelius is going to make his money in shipping during the Civil War. He's really going to exploit exploit the war for for his own good. He's going to throughout this throughout the war itself is going to get the get the nickname of a Commodore. So whenever you hear Commodore Vanderbilt, we're talking about Cornelius, and he is going to foreshadow that railroads are going to be the next big thing, and he's going to become this railroad magnate. Everyone is going to go to him for his shipping lanes, and he's going to basically be able to charge anything that he wants. Remember, even going back to the farmer problems we talked about in the last screencast, Vanderbilt is really going to be a, a cause to this problem. His biggest accomplishment is going to be gr the building of Grand Central Station in New York City. And just like with all the other industrialists we're going to talk about, he's going to give away a lot of money. He's going to endow, which means give away, over $1 million for the creation of Vanderbilt University. And Vanderbilt 
their net their family net worth today is close to 143 billion dollars absolutely outrageous he's one of the richest they're one of the richest families in the world the next industrialist we're talking about is andrew carnegie andrew carnegie is an immigrant he comes here very very poor he is really going to be a rag to riches story he is going to uh, work very odd jobs from a very young age but he's really going to make his money in steel with that bessemer process so by 1890, his company is going to control almost the entire steel industry. And he's going to do this through a process known as vertical integration, which is buying up suppliers. So for Carnegie itself, it's buying coal mines, iron mines, and railroads. And this is going to allow him to ship his goods at a much cheaper price. And that way he can lower his prices, but also still make a lot of money. Uh, like, it, like with Vanderbilt, Carnegie is going to give a lot of his money away throughout his lifetime. Education, if you've heard of Carnegie Mellon University... Also, a major uh, area that he liked to give money away to was for the creation of libraries and, of course, Carnegie Hall in New York City. And by 1901, J.P. Morgan is going to approach Carnegie about selling his steel business, and Carnegie is ultimately going to sell it for $480 million. There's a funny story behind it. Uh, J.P. Morgan asked Carnegie basically to write his figure down that he would sell his company for, and he writes this astronomical $480 million number down, and J.P. Morgan jumps at it. So uh, it's kind of funny that Carnegie says later that he probably could have written it for, for $580 million, and J.P. Morgan probably would have still have bought it, which is true, probably. Here's a, a shot of what a Carnegie steel mill would look like. It is very, very dangerous at this point. It's dark, it's dingy, it's cloudy, and it's very, very hot conditions. I mean, we're talking about molten steel here at this point. So it's definitely not something that you would want to uh, want to uh, kind of lose concentration at. We'll talk about that uh, in the next screencast with how many hours these people are actually working. The next guy, J.P. Morgan, he is the financial backer. He is all about money. His family has been in banking for generations. And you may uh, be familiar with the name from J.P. Morgan Chase Bank today. He is going to finance guys like Thomas Edison as well. Uh, corporate finance and consolidation of business is his claim to fame. And he's going to create one of the largest companies in the world when he buys Carnegie Steel. He's going to change the name to U.S. Steel. And U.S. Steel is going to be the first billion-dollar industry. Uh, it's going to control over two-thirds of the world's steel production and is just an incredible company. And throughout his – with his different holding companies that he's going to create, it is going to finance Thomas Edison. And J.P. Morgan's house is the first house ever to be electrified. He's really going to start off the – bringing electricity to people's homes. Now, our last major guy that we're going to talk about is this guy. His name is John D. Rockefeller. His company today is Chevron. John D. Rockefeller is a deeply religious man, and it's funny because the back and forth that he and Carnegie have is really interesting. Uh, Carnegie, throughout, when they kind of send each other these Christmas gifts, they're, they're going to be kind of taking jabs at each other, and one of the gifts that Carnegie is going to send Rockefeller is a bottle of scotch whiskey. And, of course, knowing that he's Baptist, he doesn't drink, so you can kind of see the uh, the funny part there Johnny Rockefeller is not going to make his money in gasoline no it is a petroleum refining business now this is pre-automobile okay so you have to keep that in mind at least to start with his petroleum refining business is known as standard oil and what he's refining is kerosene okay and what he's going to do is force the competition straight out of the market by offering very very low prices and this process is known as horizontal integration Horizontal integration means that he's going to offer uh, his prices so low that his competitors cannot keep pace. And when they are going to go out of business, he buys out their businesses and at that point is really going to raise the prices even higher than what he had, what the market rate was uh, in the first place. Also, because he is going to be such a large supplier, he is going to get rebates, which is a huge discount in shipping his high volumes of kerosene by rail. And when the railroad company tries to break Rockefeller's power, he's going to create the world's first oil pipeline. Figured uh, if it can be done with, with water, it can be done with gas. So uh, in the early 1900s, Rockefeller's has become our very first billionaire. Yes, I said billionaire with a B, and that's 1900 money. So uh, philanthropy, he's going to give away about $550 million. And again, education and medicine – with his uh, donations, they're going to be we're going to be able to cure yellow fever. Now, Robert Barron itself, uh, the term is a wealthy businessman who is perceived to have used illegal practices in order to become wealthy, and they were known to 
basically flaunt their money and pay corrupt officials to enact laws to support their business, which is basically a tariff. And what they're doing is creating monopolies, which is creating one company that owns the entire industry with uh, to create unfair rates or prices for the consumer. Again, think back to the railroads and those farmers having to pay really high prices. Also, their workers are going to be paid very, very little uh, profits, very little money, uh, which would give those business owners very large profits. And the term itself, a robber being a criminal and a baron, which is an illegitimate aristocracy, it's kind of an older term. But you can kind of see here, robber, baron, and are these guys criminals and what they're doing? Are they bad people or are they good people? They're giving away their money, but what are they doing business practice-wise? Or you may consider them a captain of industry. So the other term is an industrial statesman, meaning more upstanding citizen, where they're a wealthy businessman that has been perceived to have contributed positively to the country despite their other business practices. And they're 100% deserving of their wealth, that they uh, came up with a great idea and they capitalized on it. And it's not their fault that they're ones making all the money. And what they're doing is expanding their industries and creating a lot of jobs for a lot of people. And they're creating new practices and driving technology and driving advancements. So that's really going to be a, a, a question that you'll have to ask yourself. What do you think? Captain of industry or robber baron? So let's recap really quick. You should be able to understand how steel influenced buildings. Uh, again, think back to the Brooklyn Bridge and being able to connect Brooklyn and Manhattan and living outside of where you worked. And the ability to build up instead of out and basically saving space. And lastly, identify if big business owners were robber barons or captains of industry. Do you think that they were using unfair business practices to become rich? Or do you think they had a great idea, they capitalized on it, and it's really not their fault? And not to mention, they gave away a lot of their money to help the greater good of the population. So if you have any questions, let me know. Find me in class. Shoot me an email. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.